right, Nitter Kibbe. It is Ethiopian spiced butter. This is the recipe that I use when I want to make ghee because this comes out so flavorful and so good that it's really useful in a lot of dishes. Um, I use it when I'm making Indian food, Indonesian food. I have fried fish in it. You, yeah, you can just use it for everything. It's great. Mm -hmm. um, when my first grandchild was born, he spent a lot of time in the intensive care unit and I visited my daughter and her husband um, and they took me to an Ethiopian restaurant. And I was, you know, very impressed. It was my first really real exposure to that food. Um, and I remembered it. And uh, a couple years later, I, I spent a long time researching how to make uh, injera and how to make the nitter kebe and how to make the berbere spice paste um, before I finally uh, set out to make it. We went all over the place looking for all the various spices required for this. Uh, and we ended up finding most of them at the co-op locally here. Uh, I didn't really have to buy anything online, which I, I really thought I was going to. Uh, but that started our expanding spice collection, which eventually um, the success of this Ethiopian food project led me to curries and Indonesian curries and Thai curries and uh, we eventually had to uh, our spice cover just exploded and that's what made us eventually come up with a way to organize our spices uh, so now we can actually find the ones we need and we have when I want to make a dish like this I have everything I need for it it's amazing so we are going to begin with um, our whole spices. So a teaspoon of black peppercorns, and I'm just going to go right into a pan here with all these, and then we're going to sweat them in the pan. Uh, a teaspoon of coriander seed. A teaspoon of fennel seed. three cloves and a cinnamon stick, a couple inches, and three black cardamom pods. Now these are not your green cardamom. This is a different beast all together. And I'm gonna crush these a little bit before I throw them in there. They don't really crush a lot, but I think it helps to open them up. Easy. Okay, so these all just go in, and I'm going to turn this on and sweat these. I'm going to turn pretty low heat. This is a dry pan, by the way. And we just want to bring out the oils in these. Might make me start coughing. And then <laughs> our dry spices. We're going to take a teaspoon of fenugreek. And if I had fenugreek seed, I would use that, but I don't. And oregano, also a teaspoon. It's a heaping teaspoon. And then a quarter teaspoon each of turmeric and nutmeg. And I'm gonna go overboard on the turmeric because I like the color in this butter. And then in addition, we have uh, three tablespoons of uh, chopped garlic, a quarter cup of chopped onion. In this case, I'm using a shallot because we had it. And um, two teaspoons or two tablespoons of grated uh, ginger. So our spices, you really want to be careful that you don't burn these spices because that just makes them bitter. All you want to do is there we go. sweat them a little bit, bring out a little bit of the flavor. This is one of those cases in life where you want to sweat the small stuff. 
trying to chew for me. <laughs> and then, while we're waiting for that, we are just going to end up, we're just going to put all this stuff in a pot with a pound of butter. And we're going to cook that on very low heat for 90 minutes to two hours. Uh, and then strain it off and you have your knitter kebe or ghee if that's easier. <laughs> yeah, ghee is a lot easier. I didn't know about this little trick of yours. Which trick? Well, the flavors that went into that butter. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we- I just use it. <laughs> I, I first made this, I don't know, it must have been eight years ago now and uh and we've been expanding our flavor palette ever since but we've been using this uh butter a lot this is where you can buy the uh one pound blocks from costco yeah, and... yeah you'd still have to cut it up though yeah yeah we only buy those by accident oh you're starting to smoke there yep Okay, so this is done. I'm gonna trade that for this. And get everything going in here. That might give your omelet some interesting flavor tomorrow. That's not the, that's the other pan. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and I'm gonna add all these dry spices I put in here. And my ginger. Start the milk. My garlic. Onion. Now, a lot of times when you make ghee, uh, you'll see instructions to uh, uh, strain off, scrape off any foam that comes to the top of your butter. But we're going to strain this through cheesecloth and all that foam and everything just comes out on the cheesecloth. So you don't have to do that. So that's it. We're just gonna let this sit here and uh, cook on very low heat. You do not want to burn this. Um, yeah, that may end up in the back burner. But it's all gonna mix together and the flavors are going to infuse into the butter and we will have a very delicious condiment. All right, our stuff of butter has been cooking along for two hours. Um, I have let it cool for a little while, oh, so it I can't would see anything. be a little better for doing this. And I'm just going to strain it through cheesecloth. Play down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're missing some. Well, this pan does not have a pour spout on it. Yeah. Lots of gunk. Yep, lots of gunk. Well, filled the jar up pretty good though. Should have. It's two cups of butter and a two cup jar. Lose a little to the cheesecloth, but can't be helped. It's alright, the butter is not that expensive. Cheaper than eggs. Just the whole house smells so good now. I went outside and it even smells good out there. <laughs> I'm 
just smoosh what we can out of this. Now, I will tell you, when dealing with turmeric, do not get it on your countertops. And uh, rinse it out of that sink quick too. Yeah, it'll stay in the sink even. I mean, it'll stay, a lot of times it'll come off after a little while, but it, it could be bad. <laughs> okay, there we have it. Our beautiful pot of gold. Let's grab a paper towel. Ah. Thank you. That'll work better. Especially since it's got that yellow gunk on it. Oh yeah. Yellow everywhere. Yep. So pretty though. Look at that. So there it is. Ta-da! And now, uh, this can actually stay at room temperature for several weeks without anything bad happening to it. Um, you can refrigerate it which is what we do and we've kept it in the refrigerator for a long time we'll put a label on and it and nothing too. has ever happened bad no. about it no uh, you can also freeze this and thaw it out to use it uh, but it, it will last for a long time and once you figure out how good this stuff is you'll use it so fast that it really won't last <laughs> very long anyway so there you have it um, that's our knitter kebe all right, so for Ethiopian food, we're gonna make berberi, which is a staple spice paste in Ethiopian cooking. Uh, this combines some whole spices, some ground spices, and some un or shallot, actually, garlic and ginger. Um, and for whole spices, I'll put the uh, amounts in the, uh, in the description. The amounts are two shallots, four garlic cloves, two tablespoons of ginger, uh, 12 cardamom pods, a tablespoon of cumin seed, a tablespoon salt, two tablespoons paprika, one tablespoon cayenne, one teaspoon black peppercorns, one teaspoon turmeric, one teaspoon fenugreek, and one teaspoon whole allspice berries, six whole cloves, and a third cup of red pepper flakes. But we have black pepper, we have allspice, we have cumin seed, um, and we have uh, cardamom pods, 12 of them, and six whole cloves. So I've got my whole spices here, and I'm going to sweat those in a pan first, and then grind them up with the uh, pepper flakes, and mix those in with our uh, powdered spices. And so we'll get to that. And then this all just gets mashed together in a mortar and pestle. Um, the problem with using a blender for this is that there's not really any liquid component to this. So it's not gonna move around in a blender well. I think if you had the right type of blender, you might be able to work it in a blender, but this is just takes elbow grease this way. So I'm going into a dry pan on a kind of a medium low heat and I'm just going to put my whole spices in here until they begin to get aromatic. Now those pans do not sit well on And there. then the thing with the cardamom pods is uh, bef before they go into the spice grinder you have to take the seeds out of the pods. Um, so we'll do all that and we'll come back once these are have done something okay so this is really aromatic you can see a little uh smoke coming off it i'm gonna put this in a bowl and let it cool before i go any further um, and then we're going to use the same pan for our onion and garlic And this begins with Knitter Kebby. I think that might be how you pronounce it. All right, so I have a couple tablespoons of Knitter Kebby in my pan. And it's an Ethiopian spiced butter or ghee. When I make ghee, this is the recipe I use. So we actually have a video 
already of making this. And into this, I have two shallots uh, chopped up, five garlic cloves all chopped up. And I'm just gonna uh, cook this a little bit on kind of a low heat. I don't really want to change the color of this. I just want to soften it a little. And once this is softened a little, I will add about two tablespoons of uh, grated ginger. And this will be all of our wet ingredients. Here's my ginger. Uh, so we'll come back when this is all done. All right, I think this is softened up enough. I put my ginger in here and I'm just gonna let this cool down a little before I try and do anything else with it. And I'm gonna go to uh, taking these seeds out of my cardamom pods. And uh, it's a little tedious, but not too bad. They, not too bad. Once you get them open, they fall right out. So. All right, so if you have a spice grinder, I have all these whole spices with my uh, cardamom seeds and everything. Uh, and I also have a third of a cup of um, red pepper flakes, and I'm gonna grind all this together. And uh, if you don't, well, if you don't plug it in, it doesn't work. <laughs> now, if you uh, don't have a spice grinder, you can do this part of the mortar and pestle as well. Uh, but you really want to get this ground pretty fine. Good. That's a nice grinder. Yeah, it is a nice grinder. So now we want to mix this with our ground spices. And I think the easiest way to do it is just to put this all right in this grinder. Now there's a lot of, this is a very spicy spice mix. So there's a um, what do we have? We have both uh, cayenne and smoked paprika. There's like two tablespoons of smoked paprika, a tablespoon of cayenne, and there's black pepper in here. Okay, so that should mix it. Now we're gonna go into our mortar and pestle. Let's see how close that mixed up and stuff. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So I'm gonna put about half of it. Well, it looks like this is all gonna fit in here. But let's start with about half of our onion and some of our spice. And we'll see what this does. This is gonna be kind of a stiff paste to move around. But, Here, let me see if we can get some light on the subject. There we go. Oh, here, I can hold that properly. Okay. There we go. Okay, so Oops. you see it's, it's still pretty juicy, but we haven't added nearly all of our spices yet. And we do need to grind up the uh, onions a bit. Add some more spice here. And then we'll add the rest of our onions, garlic and ginger. That's really got a good smell to it. <clears throat> For, and I can't smell things very well, so. <clears throat> got a lot going on. So this is a flavor <clears throat> this, both this and the uh, nitrokebe, the butter, are flavors used in just about every dish that I've seen so far in Ethiopian cooking. Uh, 
Ethiopia is a fascinating little country. It's very mountainous in North Africa. The Blue Nile, which is one of the two main branches of the Nile, originates in Ethiopia. The main stem of the Nile, uh, I think that's the White Nile, I could be wrong, uh, originates uh, in Lake Victoria down near um, Congo and Uganda. And in the spring, these, this, there's a lot of snow melt involved and these two rivers create the annual floods that made the Nile Delta so fertile and such a uh, hot spot for civilization long, long ago. And then recently, uh, well, Ethiopia has been having a lot of uh, civil unrest with Eritrea to the north. And um, they have also decided to build a large dam on the uh, Blue Nile, which should be, I think it was completed recently or it's about to be completed or something. It, uh, there's lots of controversy over that project. Especially from people downstream. Yeah, so this is <clears throat> getting very stiff now. And it's, you know, <clears throat> this uh, mortar and pestle is just barely big enough to handle this. But it's kind of I a small. Pretty much got my. Bowl, so. Pretty much got my uh, product here. Now this can be refrigerated for a long, long time without anything bad happening to it. Um, let's scrape this up and see if it's incorporated in well enough. <clears throat> I'm seeing, uh, seeing what I need to see here. I believe we've got our bear berry paste. I see a few pieces of onion that could have been smaller, but <clears throat> I don't know if I'm gonna get them smaller in this device. That's a corner of the counter that squeaks. Yeah, we'll take care of that soon. <clears throat> okay. I think I'm going to call that good. Now, this is enough bear berry to make uh, Ethiopian meals for Years? a long time. <coughs> it's a little spicy. <coughs> it is spicy. I think it's... <coughs> You don't use very much of this. Um, I'm a wimp too. I have seen one a recipe that calls for like four tablespoons, but that's actually a lot. <clears throat> so. <clears throat> okay. And there is our bear berry. Today we are going to make injera. Injera is a fermented bread that comes to us from Ethiopia, home of Haile Selassie and land revered by the Rastafarians. Uh, it's a North African country that was uh, very Christian early on, um, and that has nothing to do with the bread, I don't think, but just a little history. Um, so this is I'm going to make a small amount, but this recipe is totally scalable. So you just double everything if you want to make a little bit more. Um, so I'm starting with a half a cup of teff flour. Now teff is uh, the smallest grain in the world. 
It makes a flour that has no gluten. Um, so to make this bread work, what we have to do is uh, ferment our teff flour a little bit. So a half cup of teff flour and a cup of room temperature water which in this room is about 72 degrees. And we will whisk this until it is completely dissolved. And I'm doing this in a clear jar so that I can see the, what happens to this over time. Uh, this should take anywhere from three to five days to get our starter uh, where it needs to be. And this just uh, should look a little foamy on top. There's a section on the side here, the bottom. Oh yeah. Big old lump. I might need a different device to get at that. So, you know, you can... You could do all this in a bowl and then pour it into a jar or however you want to do it. It's, it's going to sit in this container for several days. got it here. So it's a little foamy on top. It looks pretty good. I don't see any lumps around the side. So we are just going to seal this and put it in a dark place and not touch it. We want it to stay room temperature-ish. So I'm going to put it up on a high shelf and uh, we will come back and check in on that every day until it's ready. Okay, so this is day one. It's doing what it's supposed to. You can see the liquid has separated out a little bit. There's not really any bubbles in the uh, stuff yet. Um, eventually, we'll need to see bubbles down in here. So this is day two. You can start to see a few little bubbles down in there. So this is looking pretty good. That's what it should be doing. Okay, so this is day three with our starter. I don't know if you can see, but there's a small bubbles, and when you move it, bubbles come up through the liquid. It's separated, there's a little foam on top. So this is what we want. Um, and then you just pour off the water. And then we're going to take our starter and three cups of teff flour. Now, if you want to keep your starter, um, you can uh, add uh, two parts flour to one part water um, to, to make it bigger. Let it sit for a little while so you have extra uh, and you can then store that in the fridge. But I'm just going to go right in here with our starter by uh, by using the quantities I did. I made really just enough starter for this project, and then we're going to turn on the mixer. And we're going to add maybe things will cooperate. Okay. Now we're going to add slowly uh, about a cup and a half of room temperature water. And it's best if you use some sort of purified water, like distilled. We happen to have reverse osmosis water here, so uh, that's what we'll be using. 
and this is, this will be a cup and a half to two cups, but you don't want you want to really stiff dough to end up here. So we're going to add it a little bit at a time, about a half cup at a time, and let this really get mixed together well. You can mix by hand if you want as well, but you're going to really need to work this dough for a good five minutes. Now we're not trying to uh, create gluten, we're just, uh, since we have here a gluten-free product, we're just uh, trying to uh, make sure that the dough is really mixed together and that the, uh, the starter is worked in. Now see it's starting to lump up, this is what we're after. And that's been a cup and a quarter of water so far. And then just let it keep working for about five minutes. And we'll have our dough. I'm gonna check it and see. I think I, I'm gonna put in just a little bit more water. Yeah, another quarter cup. So we'll let this work and uh, I'm back and see what we do with it next. All right, so um, it's been about four minutes. That might have been just a little too much water. It's sticking to the sides a little, which is really not uh, really desirable. However, it comes off really easily, so I think we're, you know, we're still okay. Um, I'll get this off the paddle. And then we are going to stick stuff. So we, we do still have a nice thick dough here, which is what we need. And we're going to put it in a bowl. And I'm using a clear bowl so that I can see what the dough does over time. Just like I used the clear vehicle for the uh, starter so I can see what it does. This might have been just a little too long in the mixer. Yeah, it got a little gooier as time went on, so I think I could have mixed it about a minute less. Looks like chocolate cake. It does. <laughs> it's not going to taste anything like chocolate no. cake. No. This might be good for that uh, Top Chef challenge where you make two things that look the same. But don't taste the same. taste different. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to pack this down in here. <laughs> yeah, not that. Apparently, not the best spatula to use. Okay, and then we are going to cover this with water, and we don't want to mix the water with the dough. We just want to cover it, and again, room temperature purified water of some sort. And all the water is supposed to do here is to keep uh, mold from growing on top of our batter. And we're gonna cover it tightly and put it in a 
dark place for three days and we'll pour the water off each day and change it out and it won't get quite as sour. If you want it really sour, just leave the same, just leave it alone for three days. Uh, you can get it more sour by making it four days, a little less sour for two days. Um, there's several variables here, but we're going for the three days in the dark. And we'll see what we got. Okay, so this has been one day and it grew a lot more than I thought it was going to. You can see all the air bubbles down in here. It's uh, it's really doing well. I just hadn't expected it to grow this much. So what we've got now is a little bit uh, juicier than I was expecting. Because the uh, water kind of, it, it just outgrew its bowl, so the water didn't really stay on top. Maybe it'll separate now. Yep. We'll see. It's even more like chocolate cake batter now. Yeah. Okay, so I'm not going to do anything else with this. I'm going to leave it for a few hours, see if it separates. If it does, and there's enough water, I won't do anything. If, uh, if it looks like there's room to put water on it, I will, but um, right now I don't see that there is room. And uh, It's pretty bubbly. Yeah, so I'm just going to let this go. Day one down. And uh, see what happens. All right, so this is uh, day two of being in this bowl. Look at how many bubbles. It's, this is really active stuff. It's going great. I'm going to float a little bit of water on top of it just to make sure that it doesn't mold. And yeah, I don't want the water to mix with it really. That's doing what I want it to. A little bit of the bubble again. And then tomorrow, we're going to uh, <clears throat> temper this and then cook our injera. So here we have day three with our dough and uh, it's really bubbly. And I'm gonna pour the water off if I can here. Yeah, I can do that. I'm gonna save it in case I need to pour some of it back in. And then I'm going to mix the dough. Oops, I got distracted. Just gonna mix this all pretty thoroughly. It's a nice consistency at this point. Um, you know, it, it, uh, it flows off the spoon, but it still coats the spoon. That's about what we want to end up with. Although we're about to make it thicker, so. We'll see how this goes. So what we're gonna do now is temper this. And this step is necessary because there's no gluten in teff. And uh, we need something to make it hold together. And this will, act, this will really activate this dough. Uh, so I've got two cups of water. I brought it to a boil. I'm gonna take it off the heat and add to it one cup of our batter. I'm gonna whisk this in and bring it back to a boil. No, not room here. And when this boils, it will thicken. And then we'll add it back into our batter. Oh, it's already yeah. it's already thickening. Well, it's kind of like a gravy. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. 
Okay, so this is already boiling, and that's all we needed. And we're gonna go back in here. Now this didn't seem, this seemed to be a little lumpy, which I think a whisk can cure. Now in, in we go with this. So now once you've done this, you, you have to uh, let this sit for at least two hours up to four hours and in that between two and four hours is when you need to cook your injera. So I can get this to... And at this point, you need to have your dough at the right consistency. It's just going to make more bubbles, and air bubbles are what injera is all about. It looks really like a nice batter. It does look like a nice batter, I think. If you need to add water, you add some of the top water back in, and at this point you don't want to add any, any more uh, regular water. And I think... I don't know. It, it looks. It does seem pretty yeah, good. I think like I'm just gonna batter. leave it alone. It's kind of probably what you want, right? Yep. Or crepe or whatever. And this can be left out, put in the fridge. I want the max uh, bubbling to go on here, so I'm gonna leave it out. But, uh, there's that step, the tempering step. Uh, I forget what it's called. Um, there's a there's an Ethiopian word for it. Oh, okay. Um, so anyway, uh, we'll come back when it's time to make the injera. All right, so this has been sitting uh, for about three and a half hours now. Uh, you can see it's bubbling uh, slowly, but still bubbling. I'm gonna stir it. And I'm just trying not to dirty too many utensils, <laughs> but <laughs> so I'm starting it with a ladle, <clears throat> and then I'm going to ladle this into measuring cup because I think I can control how it goes on the pan a little bit easier. Now the actual way to make these is in a comal, which is a 16-inch flat pan with a very small rim. We don't have one. So we're uh, we're making up something here and hoping that this griddle will do the job. I've, I've cooked these did. before and I've cooked them on this and it worked out really well. We're looking for about 350 degrees. And uh, the, the comal is round, and injera is generally round. I think we're... And this is gonna keep heating up for a while. So let's put this on. Do an experiment. So we're gonna experiment here, try our first one. You go around the outside. Almost like a funnel cake. Concentric circles to the middle. Shake, shake. And cover. Now, this, you can see this is making bubbles, which is exactly what it's yep. supposed to totally do. like a pancake. And it's the steam that's supposed to cook the top side. So you do not flip this. Oh, you don't. Ah, I was wondering how you did that before. Because flipping pancakes is hard enough. Mm-hmm. And... 
This should take about three minutes. Ooh, look at that. Oh, you think you might want to turn your heat down or? Uh, probably. That's cooking really well. Uh, you see the outside edge will start to dry. Uh, the middle will look slightly undone when it's actually done and when it cools, it will, it will look fine. Um, we just do want to be careful that we're not burning it. Um, this one's almost done. I see there's a, still a couple of un, uncooked spots. You see the white spots in here. Those are not really cooked. Going quick though. Yep, going quick. And the outside, the outside hasn't really dried yet. We're still doing fine. Put a little more glue in here. All right, now we're going to go off onto a cooling rack. Uh, a piece of parchment paper works fine. Um, I'm going to try just going right on the rack here. Uh oh. <laughs> Curve. Uh, there you go. Close okay. enough. And now, let's just see. This probably isn't necessary, but. Yeah. I'm... No, it's going to take it too long. We're just going to go and make another one. I'm going to go a little bit bigger this time. And then shake it, fill the gaps, and cover it. And we'll see what happens. This one looks pretty good. What's the other side look like? Can, you, nice can you tell it all? Bubbly. Oh. The other side looks yeah. good. Perfect. Yeah, the teff, teff is a brown flower, so uh, this brownness is to be expected. I have, I've made injera before with a different recipe that used some wheat flour. And so it came out lighter and, uh, but since we're making a gluten-free version, which is, this is actually a more traditional version anyway, um, we will not be adding wheat flour. And that other one also was with a sourdough starter, right? Yes. That, if Which was gonna, the flour. If you're gonna use, yeah, if you're gonna use wheat, then you can use a sourdough starter to get the teff going, and uh, you feed it with teff, so eventually it turns into a teff st sourdough starter. But uh, yeah, that was it worked really well. It had slightly bigger bubbles than this, but. Um, I'm pretty happy with the way this is turning out. Um, we have another pan that's a similar size that has higher sides that I think would work as well and it would make them rounder. But that looks pretty good. This is pretty good. Don't we call that rustic? Yeah. And you want to cool them somewhat before you try stacking them on each other or they'll just kind of glue together. And, uh... Ooh, that's gonna be tricky. Okay, so. Oh, there you go. Oh. Repeat. I think I'll let you get on those for a while. Okay. All right, so this recipe made seven of these uh, slightly smaller than customary injera. 
<clears throat> pretty nice looking though. These can be used <clears throat> in a variety of ways. Um, you can put one down on a plate and serve the various uh, stews on top of it, or you can cut it into strips, roll them up, and then people can uh, take one and use it to either scoop stew up or spoon stew onto it and eat it, uh, using it as a uh, eating utensil. Um, it's, it's great stuff. So there you have injera. Um, <clears throat> you can find plenty more tips and tricks for making injera on the Tef Company website, tefco, T-E-F-F-C-O dot com. And that's, that's where this recipe came from and it, it worked really nicely. And <laughs> All right, so the main dish for our Ethiopian meal is zigni, which is goat and onion, caramelized onion stew. Uh, so to begin with, we're going to caramelize two red onions. Um, I have three tablespoons of our nitter kebe. I really don't know how to pronounce that. I think ghee works a lot better. I couldn't better. get anything to tell me. Uh -huh. um, and I'm just going to put these onions in with this and I'm going to cook it for two hours until it, the onions are really caramelized. And then we'll add everything else and cook it some more. So here's how it looks after one hour. It's uh, cooking way down. Another hour and we'll have our caramelized onions. Okay, so uh, two hours of cooking and you can see this is just, it's cooked down and it's really delightfully caramelized. Um, it's still not sticking to the pan very much. It's beginning to just a little. So we're gonna go in with a tablespoon and a half of ginger. And big noise, a tablespoon and a half of garlic. And we're going to cook this for another 10 minutes. All the good stuff. Yes. So yeah, we'll give this 10 minutes to uh, kind of cook that garlic and ginger a little bit. And uh, then we'll be ready to add some more flavor. All right, so with our, after the 10 minutes on our garlic and ginger, we add another three tablespoons of uh, our uh, ghee, nitro kebi or whatever, and one tablespoon of our bear bear. Now, if you want this hotter, just go ahead and add yeah, don't make it more uh, bear bear, but I want to make this so uh, Kelly can enjoy it. You need to add more hot than to take away the hot. And then I'm going to add a quarter teaspoon of cinnamon. And just a pinch of nutmeg. I'm going to stir this around, cook it for another 10 minutes. And we'll be back. Stir, stir. All right, so we're going to go in with a teaspoon of salt. I think I'm going to go light on this by a little. You can always add more salt. And one 14 ounce can of diced tomatoes. Uh, you could use fresh tomatoes for this, but you really want to cut them up small and maybe even um, zoop them up in the blender uh, before you put them in here. And one tablespoon of white wine vinegar. So we're going to cook this for another 10 minutes, get these flavors to marry, and then we're going to add our meat. 
All right, so this is back up to cooking. So now I'm gonna add my meat. Now you can make this dish with any kind of meat you'd like. What you want is uh, one and a half, between one and a half and two and a half pounds of your chosen meat cut into bite-sized pieces. Um, we had some goat meat in the freezer that needed to get used, so we're making this the traditional way with goat meat. It can also be made with uh, cow meat. You can make it with chicken. Um, pork. Pork. Take your pick. Um, there are... I was just reading an article about goats in uh, Ethiopia. And there are... Uh, something like a... I want to say it was like a billion and a half goats in Ethiopia. That seems like a lot, but I'm pretty sure that's what they, I think so. I think that's what that's, they were saying. You have um, a good family if you got some goats. And uh, so goat meat would be very typical. And uh, so that's what we're doing for our dinner. And uh, we're going to let this cook now for probably 90 minutes. And uh, hopefully the goat meat will just be tender by then. Uh, with chicken, you would cook it a little less time. Just, you know, keep an eye on it and see when your meat is done and tender. Uh, that's when it's done. All right, it's time to dish up our zigni. It's, it's a, a loose stew. It has quite a bit of moisture in it, which is good because we're putting it right on top of injera. And the uh, injera is going to soak up a lot of moisture. It's the man plate over there. And, yeah, look how nicely this came out. Yeah, that's And I have to tell you, this is really tasty. The caramelized onions make it nice and sweet. And, um, it's plenty for mine. It's, it's not overly spicy, so Kelly can eat it. Um, so there, there is the zigni, the goat and caramelized onion stew. So now we are going to make misir wat, which is Ethiopian cooked lentils. So I have um, three tablespoons of nitro kebi, in, which is the butter, in uh, this pot. I'm going to go on about a medium heat and cook my onions for about 10 minutes. Then I'll add tomatoes, tomato paste, and some bare berry, and some garlic. And we have this little garlic smasher, which is, you know, it's uh, It's like a mincer, actually, I think. Yeah, it's very similar to a uh, marijuana grinder, <laughs> um, which, you know, in this part of the country, they've been around for a long time. But this just, in a few little twists, minces up your garlic just great. So I'm going to go in the pot with my onions. And we'll give this uh, about 10 minutes. They're, they should turn brown. We want them to be, you know, really quite cooked. Maybe even almost caramelized. Yeah, there we go. Oops. Totally missed. Yeah. <laughs> I just make a mess no matter what. That's right. All right, so we'll come back when this uh, has cooked down a bit. All right, these have cooked along near 10 minutes or so. I love the color the spiced butter brings out in these, the yellow color. So now we're going to add our garlic. The only thing about this device is it can be a little tricky to get the garlic out yeah, of it. Yeah, it is. Um, but, you know. Garlic press wastes a lot of it too, so <clears throat> your choice. You could probably get what you can out and squish it again. You get a loosen it. Might. Let's try. It. See what happens. It's fine. Nothing else. Yeah. No. Yep. Cool. See. Uh -huh. So there you have a trick. Kitchen tricks. I don't even know what it's called. I just saw an ad for it one day and 
Let's All right. check it out. So, along with our garlic, we're going to add three tablespoons of tomato paste. One chopped tomato. Yeah, it's fine, you know. Miss? Production crew will clean that up. <laughs> oh, okay, good. Um, and one tablespoon of our bare berry. So you can see between the uh, spiced butter and the bare berry, we're putting quite a lot of flavor into this pot. And now we're going to cook this stuff together for another five minutes or so. And then we'll add our broth, our lentils, and some salt. And that's our dish. Now there, it doesn't matter which color lentils you use, they come in a variety. Um, I'm using red lentils and um, <clears throat> because all I could find, I needed a few more than what I had and all I could find at the time was split lentils. These should be whole lentils, be much more traditional. Split lentils are going to work. But, and at this stage, um, turn the heat down so you don't burn this, you just want this to cook and get those flavors all out and available. Mm -mm -mm. It's gonna be, smells delicious so far. So we'll come back after this is cooked for about five minutes. All right, so this has been cooking along. It's a nice uh, browned goo. We're gonna add our lentils. And our two and a half cups, that was one cup of lentils, two and a half cups of chicken broth. If you want to make this vegetarian, which would not be uh, unheard of, especially with the North African cooking, uh, you can use vegetable broth. And this is also going to get one teaspoon of salt. We're going to bring it to a boil. Turn the heat down to low. Probably even put it on a different burner because this doesn't go very low. And uh, one teaspoon of salt. And then we're gonna cook it on low for 40 minutes. And covered. And we should have our lentil dish. Uh, once it's done, we'll add another tablespoon of bare berry and another tablespoon of the nitre kibbe. Um, add it at the end. All right, so our misir wat. Here's a meat dish on our um, uh, injera. injera. <laughs> and, uh, and then this is a lentil dish to go on it as well. Uh, really, if we ate a lot more food, we would probably have made a vegetable dish as well. But I think this is just going to be plenty of food. I think and so. So, this is uh, actually a little spicy. I'm recommending that Kelly eat it with a little bit of sour cream. <laughs> um, so Ethiopian. <clears throat> well, you know, they have... Goats, they have goat milk. Goat cheese, so, any goat cheese handy? Well, they, I don't, but <laughs> I'm sure they do. So anyway, uh, there is our Monsieur Watt. And, um, I think you should taste it. Okay. Tell us what you think. How did it taste? How did it turn out? That's the lentils. It's really good. And, These two things have really similar ingredients to make the flavor profiles, but they taste really quite a lot different. 
so which is a good thing. So there's our misiwat. All right, so there's our Ethiopian dinner. We have the zigni, the misiwat, the uh, injera, <laughs> um, and it's just really going to be good. Thanks for watching Two Cooks in the Kitchen. Subscribe, and you'll see a new video every Tuesday. Uh, and we'll see you next time.